again, good morning, and it's very good to see each and every one of you this morning. Uh, there's so many things that have been going on this week and this weekend. It's just been jam-packed, and it's all been good. Uh, I want to thank everybody uh, who had a hand in the coat drive and the pizza with Santa that we had Friday night. It was a wonderful outreach event. I believe over 400 coats were donated towards that cause, and that's just remarkable. And we have already seen that there are several from that event that have wanted to study the Bible, whether in their home or uh, through a correspondence course, and that's just wonderful. What a wonderful impact that, that was on the community. Uh, everybody uh, that was here, that gave coats, that supported it in any kind of way, and especially, they don't like me calling their names, but, but Kitty and Tanya both had a huge hand in, in driving that whole process forward, and so many others, and thank you so much for that. Uh, we, we have uh, several things going on uh, at this moment at this church, and, and my mind is just swimming with them at, at the moment. Uh, we have a big Sunday coming up next Sunday. Uh, every year, uh, the elders, in order to put together the budget for this congregation, uh, they don't set it themselves. Uh, they don't set a mark for us all to hit. They say, well, you set it. And, and Purpose Sunday is a very, very important Sunday for this congregation. What is Purpose next week? We'll make the budget for 2017. And so let's all be prayerfully considering our financial commitment, our commitment as a whole, but our financial commitment in particular uh, next Sunday. And more will be said about that uh, as we go along. Uh, we've been doing these centurion scriptures week by week. I uh, have the next one up for this morning up on the, the screen right now. I do just want to say a word about that as well, uh, because uh, you may have thought, well, to, in order to participate in that, I have to register for lads and, and have to be a part of the convention. Well, no, you don't have to do any of that. Uh, we can do centurion of scripture without having to register or go through uh, any of the other lads' procedures. Uh, but we do need to sign up in some form or fashion, and so there is a centurion sign-up in the foyer this morning. If you would like to sign up to be recognized at our um, banquet that we hold here before we go, or actually after we go to convention, uh, that is in the foyer there, if you would sign up for that. You don't have to have it completed by now, it's just the commitment to complete it, and sometimes that really is helpful uh, to make a commitment. It helps us to actually reach that goal that we set for ourselves. But this morning, uh, in line with what we're going to be talking about, we have a short one, Proverbs 23, 26. Let's say this one together, and let's see if we can get that written on our hearts by the end of the day. Proverbs 23, 26. My son, give me your heart, and let your eyes observe my ways. Very good. One more time. My son, give me your heart, and let your eyes observe my ways. We're talking this morning about being consumed. And it's in our series that we started last week, The Work is Great, based on 1 Chronicles chapter 29, because the work of the Lord, the work of building the Lord's house in this generation, and in particular in this community, is a great work. It's the greatest work that's ever been given anyone. And we need to realize just how great this work is, because as we said last week, the effort that we put into accomplishing a particular task is directly determined by how great or how small that we perceive that task to be. So let's see this task is great. This is a great work. We need to understand that it is great because of who it's for. It's not for us. It's for God. We're building a house for God, and that alone is what makes this work so great. When we make life all about looking out to our interests, life just doesn't work. Remember what Haggai told the people? You came right home and got to work building your houses, but life is not working, is it? You eat and you're still hungry. You drink and you're still thirsty. You buy clothes and put them on, but you are still cold. You earn wages, but you put them into a bag that has holes in it. And life just is not working for you, is it? And Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 33, you've got to seek first the kingdom. And then all these other things, they, they fall into their proper places. And life works. But when we do not seek God's house first, when we do not put this work as great and primary in our lives, our lives just don't work. And we've got to focus on, focus on doing God's work first because his work is great and all these things, they'll fall into their proper place. So, so based on all these things that we read in the word, I just want to distill it into this one statement that really pretty much covers 
last week. It's a pledge to make. And, and I want to say it this way. The work is great, so I'm going to give it my best. The work is great, so I'm going to give it my best. I'm going to take pride in building the house of God. I'm not going to busy myself with building my own house to the neglect of building God's house. The work is great. I'm going to take pride in this work. We take pride in work, and it changes the character of the work, doesn't it? We talk about it a little bit more. We put a little bit more effort into it. I'm going to take pride in this work. We're building the house of God. And so let's make this pledge our pledge for living every single day. The work is great, and so let's look at David's response. Let's get back into the First Chronicles 29 text. Uh, we talked about verse 1 last week. And then David goes on, he explains how he made a provision of gold and silver and other precious building materials. By the way, this particular verse 2 offering is not counted. We don't know how much it was. It was uh, no doubt a large offering in and of itself. But then we go to verse 3, and I want to start picking up there. David said, Moreover, in addition to all that I provided for the holy house, I have a treasure of my own, of gold and silver, and because of my devotion to the house of my God, I give it to the house of my God. David says, I have a treasure of my own. Do you have a treasure of your own? David says, I have a treasure of my own. The word in the original language here, it means any possession that is highly valued by its owner. This is something that David valued. It wasn't something that he was giving away that he didn't really think much of. It would be okay to give this away. It's just sitting there collecting dust anyway. I won't miss it. No, he said, I have a treasure of my own. You may remember that time that David was commanded by God to raise an altar on the threshing floor of Aruna. Now this is 2 Samuel chapter 24. And, and there has been a calamity in the land. David has committed a sin. And because of that sin, there's great distress in the land. But God comes to him and says, I will end this distress once you go and erect an altar on the threshing floor of Aruna. Now he did not own the threshing floor of Aruna. So he comes to Aruna. And he says, I want to do this on your piece of property here. Tell me how much I owe you. Now, Aruna, or bless Aruna's heart, he has a wonderful heart for God, and he says what I imagine any of us would have said. Oh, if it's for Lord, just take it. Anything that you need, take it, and I want to have a part in this offering to the Lord. Please, you do not owe me anything. As a matter of fact, Aruna starts looking around. It. It's almost like he, he's not prepared for this, but, but he's just wanting to throw in everything he can throw. How about that plow over there? We can just break that down, and you can use that wood to offer up the oxen. I've got oxen back out here. You can use those. Uh, the yoke that, that put, puts the oxen together, we'll break that, and you can, you can use that for wood for the offering. Aruna's just going out of his mind trying to find anything. You can use anything I have. Please take it for this offering to God. But look at verse 24. Uh, we need to have a heart like Aruna, don't we? I, I wish, well, just every one of us take up a heart like that. Lord, take it all. Here it is. Take it all, whatever you need. But let's look at David's response there in verse 24. But the king said to Aruna, Uh-oh. Oh, well. <laughs> but the king said to Aruna, No, no. I'm not going to do that. No, but I will buy, you, buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. I won't do that. I will not offer offerings to my Lord that cost me nothing. It defeats the whole purpose. It defeats the whole purpose of an offering if we give God something that costs us nothing. That's the purpose. God does not want our stuff. That's not the point of an offering. God does not want our stuff. God wants us. God does not want your money. God wants your heart. And that's the point of the offering. David says, if I give an offering but it didn't cost me anything, that's not me giving me. And the, the offering is pointless. I'm not going to engage in something like that. David says in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, I have a treasure of my own. Things that are valuable to me and because of my devotion to God I give it to the house of God because I am devoted to God my treasure is devoted to God and let's pick up in verse 4 what is this treasure 
3,000 talents of gold, the gold of Ophir, and 7,000 talents of refined silver for overlaying the walls of the house, and for all the work to be done by craftsmen, gold for the things of gold and silver for the things of silver, who then will offer willingly, consecrating himself today to the Lord? Now, we mentioned last week that Israel and David combined, they give over $11 billion that we can count in this text to the Lord on that occasion. Here we read of David's treasure. This accounts for over $4 billion of that total, a very large sum that David is giving here in his treasure to the Lord. 113 tons of gold, 264 tons of silver. It's an incredible treasure that he's giving here. But what I really want to key in on is not necessarily the monetary value here, but this call to action there at the end of verse 5. This is David addressing the nation here at the end of verse 5. Who then will offer willingly, consecrating himself today to the Lord? Now, now time out. Time, time out, David. David, are you asking for our stuff? Are you asking for us? Uh, you said two different things there, David. You, you said we're, we're putting together this financial gift and who's going to offer willingly, who's going to take part in it. But then you said who's going to consecrate himself. And, and David, which one do you want? Do you want our stuff or, or do you want us? And, and I, I think here's the answer, yes. Yes, I, I do. <laughs> God does. God does want you. God does want your stuff. God doesn't want your stuff he wants you and when he has you doesn't he have your stuff god doesn't want your 11 billion dollars god wants your heart and god doesn't want nor does god deserve anything less than 100 percent of your heart if we give god anything I, I want us to write this phrase on our hearts keep it there before our eyes continually if i give god anything only let it be everything if I give God anything, only let it be everything. Because God doesn't just want some of your stuff. God wants you. Consecrate himself. Who's going to do that today? Who's going to consecrate his whole heart, his whole self to God today? You remember how the Macedonians took hold of this concept when they were raising funds for the churches down in Judea. Uh, the brethren there were going through a terrible famine, terrible distress. And Paul was kind of doing double duty as he goes around the Mediterranean rim. He's planting churches, he's spreading the gospel, but as he's doing so, he's telling people about the situation of Judea. It's terrible. Why don't we raise some funds to help them? And so Paul is spreading the gospel and he's raising funds for the brethren in Judea here at the same time. And the Macedonians catch wind of this. And the Macedonians don't have much. But the Macedonians want so badly to take part and this offering for the saints down in Judea. Let's read in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. As Paul now is telling the Corinthians about what he ran into with the Macedonians. He said, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty. Now, how often do you see those two phrases put together? Their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. These people gave a mind-blowing financial gift. Paul says, in a severe test of affliction they were. He says they were in extreme poverty, and yet, and yet their abundance of joy overflowed in a wealth of generosity. He says they gave beyond their means. They didn't just give as much as they could. They gave more than they really could. They gave beyond their means, not because somebody asked them to, by the way, we didn't go to their doorstep raising funds for this. We knew they were in extreme poverty, but they begged us. They came to us and they begged us earnestly to let them give. Now, how about that? that that's a mind-blowing financial gift. But, but here's where it starts. It didn't start as a financial gift. Paul says they gave themselves first. They gave themselves first to the Lord 
and then by the will of God to us. First Chronicles 29, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, what do they have in common? These are two incredible outpourings of financial giving that really are only symptoms of the real gift. The money was not the real gift here in both of these instances. They're symptoms of the real gift because on both occasions they first gave themselves to God and then everything else followed. They first said, if we commit to give God anything, only let it be everything. They first realized God does not want our stuff. God wants us. And they gave and they gave and they gave. They gave themselves to the Lord and then they begged. They begged that they would let us Join in that giving for the saints in Judea. Can, can you just get that picture in your mind? I, I have to work hard to see that, to get that image in my mind of, of these people just begging, please, please let us give. Please let us take part. We believe in this great work of the Lord that you're doing. We believe in what you do as a church. I love it with all my heart. I've given my heart to my God, and I've come to love what you are doing for the Lord here. Will you please allow me the great blessing of giving to this work. Please, please let us give. Can you just imagine it? What a wonderful and yet strange image that is. When we went back to the um, Israel Museum just a few months ago over there in Georgia. It was really a cool thing. Uh, if you ever have the chance to uh, visit there, you should. It's, it's very neat. And you get to see many things of the early Palestinian life, the threshing floor and the wine press and the oil press, all kinds of stuff they've got set up there. Uh, but the biblical meal was really my favorite. When you go into that triclinium table and you don't lean over on your sides like they did, you sit, but, but you get to take part of all the, the, the kind of cultural fixtures that they would have on that table. And they taught us that the man that was our guide, uh, he did a very good job. And he tried to incorporate as much of Jewish culture as he could into that meal. And he said there is a, uh, something that they do at the meal there in Jewish culture, even today, that when they pass the plate, and they have, you know, if everybody's eating bitter herbs, the plate of bitter herbs goes around, you, you pass the plate around. As you pass the plate to someone else, you say, you do me honor. You do me honor. And, and he described, why would you say that? Why do you say you do me honor? He said this, he said that they understand service to be such a blessed opportunity, such an honor to have the opportunity to serve, that when you pass the plate, that person that is receiving the plate has given you the opportunity to serve, and so they have done you honor. You do me honor. I've received an honor to serve. It says here, it says here in verse 1 that the grace of God was given to the Macedonian church. They received grace from God because they were granted. When they begged, let us give, they were granted that opportunity. And they received the grace of God. Verse 4, they begged for the favor of taking part in this offering. Now the ESV says favor here, but the word is the same in the original language. They begged for the grace of taking part in this offering. It is a grace and it is a blessing to have the opportunity to give to God. Because we are taking things that are not our things, and we are turning them into eternal things. If you'll drop down in our text in First Chronicles with me, David's going to explain why, just why giving is a grace. There in verse 10, we come to a prayer, and it's a beautiful prayer. It's a beautiful prayer to be prayed at any time. But David turns his eyes heavenward, and he prays this in front of all the assembly. Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly, and David said... Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you. And you rule over all. In your hand are power and might. And in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I? And what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. For we are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there's no abiding. O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name 
comes from your hand and is all your own. I want you to notice how this one particular thought is just packed into every corner of this prayer, and that is everything belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. Verse 11, all that's in the heavens and in the earth, it's yours. Verse 12, both riches and honor come from you. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Verse 14, all things come from you. Verse 16, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand. It's all your own. And then right there, right there in the middle of the prayer, back to verse 14, I want, to see, I want us to see the attitude that fueled the whole thing. This is the reason that the Macedonians begged to give. Verse 14, David says it, But who am I? But who am I and what is my people? That we should be able to thus offer willingly. For all things come from you and on your own, of your own we have given to you. Who am I? Who am I? Casting Crowns has this song out entitled, Who Am I? It's been covered several times. Uh, it was uh, done by the Pepperdine singing group, one by one, and that's, I have that on CD. It's a beautiful, beautiful song, one of my favorites. I want to read to you the chorus of that song, Who Am I? It goes, not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow, a wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind. Still, you hear me when I'm calling. Lord, you catch me when I'm falling. And you've told me who I am. I'm yours. Who am I? I'm the Lord's. That's who I am. Who am I? I'm the Lord's. David says, who am I? Who am I to bless you? Who am I to have this opportunity of grace to take that which is eternally worthless and turn it into a thing, a gift of eternal value? Who am I to be able to do that? Who am I, Lord? Because you know, you know that all I've done is taken what is yours and given it back to you. All things come from you. Of your own, we have given to you. Who am I? You see, this is the recognition that all things belong to God and that it is a great grace of God that we can use these things for his eternal purposes. That is the recognition that drives truly extraordinary givers. When we come to this recognition that who am I? Because all things come from him. The word is consumed. The word is consumed. In light of the abundant goodness and the great work of our God, the only appropriate response is complete and total sacrifice of self to be consumed by his will. I want to be consumed by the will of God. Is this about our financial giving? No, not really. It's about our heart. It's about our heart. It's about giving ourselves first to the Lord. It's about making the pledge, if I commit to give God anything, only let it be everything. It's about recognizing that all things belong to God, including myself. Is it going to show itself in my financial giving? Naturally, of course. Of course it will. In light of everything that we have studied, I understand now giving to be a grace. I, and, and it's not a grace that I bestow upon the Lord it's the other way around. It's a grace that the Lord bestows upon me to have this opportunity to take part, to partner in his work in this world, to participate in the eternal kingdom of God where the, where the father and the children, they love one another and they share in all things and where the children take every opportunity to show glory and honor to the father. What a grace. What a blessing to take part in this kingdom. We want to be a people consumed by the Father's will in all things, because who are we apart from them? If you would please pray with me. Father, we love you, and we thank you so much for all things. We, we thank you for your overwhelming, abundant blessings in our lives. Father, we, we realize that just to be in your kingdom, just to participate in the eternal kingdom that will be forever and ever, in which the gates of hell will never come against, never have victory over. Father, we are incredibly blessed. And Father, we thank you for the great grace of taking part in this kingdom. Father, we give ourselves to you, our whole hearts, 100%. Father, we desire not to leave anything back. And yet, Father, we are forgetful. Father, we have 
the tendencies of selfishness, tendencies of pride. Father, we pray that you wage a, a war and a victory over these. Help us to, to rend our entire hearts over to you. And Father, please help us when we fall short. Please pick us back up and help us back along the way and, and remind us constantly that we are yours and we are nothing apart from you. Father, we, we pray that you would use our offerings in, in a glorious manner. We, we pray, that, pray that you would use our, our entire selves, put us into your service, and bring others to you through us, and strengthen us through one another. Father, use us for your purposes. We desire to be used up in them. Father, we pray all these things in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here this morning, and your life does not belong to this Lord, once you give it to him, he looked to you and he gave the very same promise. God said, if I look to commit anything to this people, only let it be everything. And he gave everything. The glories of heaven, the, 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 the peace and the security of being who he is, God Almighty. He laid it down and he came and he suffered and he gave everything for you. Won't you put your life in his hands? I can't think of any better place to put it. If you're here this morning, you're not a Christian, won't you come to him by faith, trusting him with your life, saying, I'm now going to live according to your ways. I'm following you. I look to you in all things, which means a matter of repentance. I'm no longer going to live my way. I'm no longer going to live against your way. I'm following you, and I'm making a 180. I'm turning around, Lord, and I'm following you. And you are who you say you are. I've come to know you are Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I need your blood. I need the washing that is only made available by the sacrifice of your blood. And so won't you come to the waters of baptism and be immersed in it. If you have need to come to him and become a Christian this morning, please come. If you are a Christian and yet you've wandered away, if you've gotten off the path, if you need to make something right, if you need to confess sins, if you need the strength of your brethren here, We'll be glad to pray over you and strengthen you. We love you. Won't you come if you have any need as we stand and as we sing?